Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Guten Gluten, Grauten, Glowen, and don't, welcome to don't. the podcast. Okay. I'm Josh, there's Chuck, and it's just the two of us today, which is why we're feeling a little crazy. Oh man, uh, I just did a cowbell as Donk Donk. I think it's it, Clonk it Clonk. Through. It came through. <laughs> There's a bit of a donk to it. I owe a big apology to, uh, what's his name? Rick Allen? Is that his name? The drummer? Def Leppard's drummer, yeah. Sounds like it. Sounds right. I mean, can you believe that a a major rock band's drummer lost his arm and learned how to play without that arm? Well, not only that. What an amazing story. It is amazing because they were like right, right about to hit their peak. They were like rocketing up. Mm-hmm. And Rocket. again, you'd think that was just the end of it, but nope, can't keep them down. What a story. I think when I was a kid and that happened, I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. But now that I'm an adult and I'm like, if I have a bad ankle sprain, I'm done. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's just amazing to me yeah. that he lost an arm and like persevered. Just incredible. What's also cool, I think, is that this is in the 80s and somebody was sharp enough to develop mm-hmm. software yeah. that that could kind of like help him with the extra beat that he he couldn't get to with just one arm like that was just amazing in and of itself as well well i thought he used uh the other foot right isn't that what he did i believe there was software involved as well oh i didn't know that i thought he just learned how to incorporate that oh no are you like well i'm not really impressed after all (laughs) i'll have to look into that more uh this has nothing to do with what we're talking about except for the uh sort of German. That's not, not even German, is it? They're British. I know, but that Untenglieben, oh, I mean, that's not, those are even real words, it. are they? No, I don't think so. <laughs> it seemed like a Swedish chef kind of thing. Oh, goodness. We're talking about learning foreign languages um, because that is something, Ed helped us out with this, and he very quickly points out that that's a real mark of, and always has been, like, oh, you know, they speak four languages. Ooh, la, la. It's like, yeah, that means, oh, boy, they're super smart or they're very worldly. Uh, and, you know, it it certainly requires some intelligence to speak many languages, I think, uh, to be a polyglot. Mm-hmm. But it's always something that people tout. And I don't blame them. If I spoke yeah. four languages, that's the first thing I'd say. Hey, I'm Chuck. I speak four languages, by the way. It almost rivals telling people that you went to Brown or Harvard. <laughs> That's only two languages. Yeah. So do you speak anything other than English these days? Well, no. We, we've talked a little bit about our language background. I took uh, high school German and then college German. Oh, that's right. And uh, did a little traveling in Germany because um, I did my European tour. But I don't remember much of it. I <laughs> don't ever practice it. But it is it was something that I would pick up, you know, quicker than if I tried to learn Spanish, which is on my list to try and do. Yeah. I really want to. It's just like, do I have the time? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, true. I just have to do it, you know? Yeah. But I really would like to learn Spanish. Because Spanish, Spanish is on my list. <laughs> uh, but before we talk about what uh, people in the biz call L2... Uh, we should talk a little bit about L1, uh, which we've talked a, a little bit about before, but L, L1 is like when, you, when you're just a little dumb baby and you mm-hmm. learn how to talk, mm-hmm. which I can now attest as, as a parent is one of the most remarkable things you can witness as oh, a well, human that, learning language. That's really neat. Seemingly by themselves, uh, because you're not saying like, this is how you say spoon. <laughs> uh, kids learn language Quickly, and it seems like innately, and we'll talk about all that now. I remember learning to read, and it almost seemed to me like overnight, like it just started clicking in, I think, first grade. Oh, yeah? Which I've always wondered, isn't that kind of late? No. Okay. Good. No, it's not at all. If you're reading in the first grade, you're doing fine. I got to impress everybody with what age I started reading at these days. No, in fact, if you're reading like pretty well at, at six, that's pretty good. I wouldn't say pretty well, but all of a sudden it was like books went from just lines of scribble to uh-huh. sensible, sensical things that I could in- decode and interpret. And I was like, wow, that's neat. No, no, that's good. Six is great. Okay, good. Thank look you. At, look at you. Thank God you're a parent because I'd be totally <laughs> lost if you weren't. 
Uh, all right, so we'll talk about some of the language theories. Um, the first, like whether or not they're still relevant or not. Uh, the first is called critical period hypothesis. Longstanding debate about this. Uh, it was proposed by uh, a dude named, a neurologist named Wilder Penfield, along with Lamar Roberts in a 1959 book called Speech and Brain Mechanisms. And this is the idea that there is a critical period in a young person, a young human's life, where your brain has the plasticity uh, that's just off the charts, and it can learn language then, and uh, after that, learning a new language is a lot harder. Yes, which seems to be what generally people think of today, right? I mean, sort of. I, I think critical period hypothesis made it seem like it was really, really, really hard after oh, this gotcha. because they didn't really believe in uh, – they thought plasticity stopped at a certain point. Okay, I got you. Yeah, because there was a, a time where people thought that you had all the neurons you were ever going to have when you were yeah. born and you just, you know, smoked hashish <laughs> and lost them over time. I was about to say the same thing. Oh, uh, yeah. Like well, you smoked them away a few at a time or exactly. whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that um, – all of your neural connections were formed, you know, in your by your teens, maybe, and then after that, you just got dumber and dumber, right? Yeah. So this is this is that that that's that school of thought. Yeah, that that basically things are pretty fixed mm -hmm. after that certain age, and that that's why it's so hard to learn language later on. But we now know that that's not true, and and your brain can still be very plastic. But it's remarkably close, just at, in its principle. In the basis of its idea, it seems yeah, pretty Yeah, because it is harder. What were the names of the two guys again? Uh, Wilder Penfield and Lamar Roberts. <laughs> they sound like a alternate universe Steely Dan, you know? Yeah, sure. Like those are the members of Steely Dan in the eighth dimension. Yeah, yeah, Penfield and Roberts. <laughs> I like it. I just made myself laugh. Uh, sponge Theory is next, and that's one that has really gone the way of the dodo, right? Yeah, they used to think that you just— Kids just absorbed everything like sponges. Like you were saying, it was remarkable and magical to watch Ruby just suddenly learn to speak. Yeah. Uh, that was noteworthy enough to enough people that they're like, we didn't teach this kid anything. They just absorbed it. Right. And there's a certain degree of that. But one of the problems with uh, sponge theory, which has generally been um, discarded, like you said, is that um, it, it really um, underestimates the importance of active learning. It's basically yeah. saying passive learning. I read there was like a New York Times blog post about kids learning L1. Mm -hmm. And um, the, somebody was saying, they were pointing out just how how poor an analogy the sponge theory is. By, mm -hmm. by They put a picture up during one of their talks where there's a, a bucket of water and then a sponge like on the table next to it. Right. <laughs> and it's like their proximity isn't enough. Like there has to be some sort of action and activity as well. You got to dip it, son. <laughs> uh, the other, another good analogy Ed pointed out is like, that's like saying if you're just an American household and, but you let your kid watch nothing but Spanish speaking television, mm -hmm. that they're just going to learn Spanish. Yeah. But apparently that works if you're an adult. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but, but watching foreign language movies can be a tool. I have a friend from way back, um, uh, he taught himself French by watching French movies, got himself a job with UPS, worked there for eight months, and then put in for a transfer to Paris and moved to Paris. What? Yeah, he was very cool. He went on to become the bass player in the number two most popular rock band in Turkey, according to a Pepsi Cola wow. poll of that nation, uh, years after he moved on from Paris. This is a friend of yours? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, he was very cool. I don't know what became of him. I lost him after he moved to Turkey, but he yeah, was a good guy. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. Um, so behaviorism is the next one, and that is – B.F. Skinner was a big proponent of this, and he, he wrote that language learning was akin to verbal behavior. So basically, you're a blank slate, and learning a language is like learning any other behavior. Mm -hmm. You learn it through reinforcement, through either being praised or being punished. And like really working at it. Right. And then um, if you, like you said, it's, that reward and punishment is really, really important where, you know. Yeah. 
That's how you learn what's right and what's wrong. That has a little bit of basis in reality, too. Like all of these competing theories, if you just carve a little bit out of each one and put yeah. it together, you've got learning language. Yeah, I think that's with a lot of theories. Like people aren't usually 100% wrong. Sure. So the opposite of behaviorism, by the way, is um, called nativism. Mm -hmm. It says, no, 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 we're not born as blank slates and we just learn by observing and, and through trial and error and reward and punishment. There's um, Our brains are basically pre-wired yeah. to not only give rise, but then also interpret and use what's called a universal grammar, that humans have some sort of inborn ability mm -hmm. to speak languages to one another. And um, this was a, a cornerstone of Noam Chomsky's career, if not the whole thing. Yeah, he talked about, and I know we talked about this in another episode, uh, the language acquisition device, uh, which is not a, a sort of a real body part, but it's like a hypothetical tool right. that Noam Chomsky, Chomsky? Why did I throw a T in there? I don't know. It's already a, a baggy name. Who names your kid Gnome? I don't know, but, I mean, it really works. Those two <laughs> names together work really well. I don't know much about this guy, but it's a name that I've heard 3,000 times in my life, so I need to brush up a little bit. He was, in addition to being a linguist, he was a very, very opinionated, mm -hmm. very far left-leaning cultural critic as well. Who made like some, some really great points, <laughs> um, but he, you know, anybody like that attracts scorn and ire. Sure. So there's a lot of critics of Noam Chomsky as well. But he was very interesting. His, his he was a public intellectual, is a way to put it, I guess. Yeah. All right. So about uh, phonemes. <laughs> what are Did those? I say that right? Yeah, phonemes. I always want to say phenomes. I know. I just goofed up, and Josh corrected me. So, we edited out that part. Phonemes. Yeah, phonemes. Uh, Ed points out that a language maybe, let's say a language has like 40-ish phonemes. <laughs> phonemes? Are you doing this on purpose now? I'm really not. I'm sort of losing my mind right now. Yeah, uh, I'm watching it unravel. It's fascinating. But, <laughs> uh, babies start to grasp these, uh, or at least the, the relevant ones of their language, as early as six months. And baby talk, the little gobbledygook sounds that babies make are different than uh, like an American baby's gobbledygook is different than a child in a little baby in Africa's gobbledygook. That's amazing. That is so cool. So those are the kind of the big theories about language acquisition, L1 acquisition, mm -hmm. right? Where you just learn your native language and you become fluent in it for whatever reason. Uh, apparently, we don't have that quite figured out yet. Now we move into L2 acquisition. And one of the fundamental hallmarks of learning a, a second language in particular is that it seems to be way easier for kids than it is for adults. That is true. Um, while I don't think that it's that like they've like you said earlier discovered that plasticity can occur in adults and it's not like an impossibility or, or really 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 hard like they used to think. Mm -hmm. It is definitely easier for a kid. Um, a kid can learn. Um, many languages uh there there really is not like a limit um there are outliers where kids you know like these little um phenoms mm -hmm, <laughs> uh learn you know six seven eight languages those are outliers for sure but like your average just sort of bilingual kid raised in a bilingual household is very common these days and um it, and it's not the case where like well, but if you're teaching your child Spanish, you know, when they're growing up as well as English, you're not – the time you're spent talking about Spanish is taking away from the English, so they're going to fall behind. And that is just proven to not be the case. Yeah. I would think, if anything, it would make you excel a little more in other stuff. It does. Supposedly, bilingual kids do better at problem-solving uh, situations. Uh, we'll talk about some other stuff like socially, mm -hmm. but they don't experience learning delays or issues. It's just not something that they've seen happen. Uh, and the fact that there's outliers like you were talking about who who learn multiple languages as children makes you kind of wonder um, what like is there an upper limit to languages that a kid can learn? And the answer is yes. Apparently, it's three. Oh, I said there was none. Is there? There, there's. Oh, non-outliers. Okay, I got you. Right. Practically speaking, mm -hmm. three is the max because language uh, experts, a.k.a. linguists, um, suggest that you need to spend about 20 to 30 percent 
of your waking time oh. practicing learning a language if you're learning another language. So you get so, up and do the math. Right. And do that math, would leave Josh. time for <laughs> <laughs> I'm never doing that again. That would leave time for nothing else. If you were focusing on learning three languages um, at once, that would be yeah. the upper limit, right? At least learning them at once, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. But there are people out there, just real quick, Chuck, who have learned tons of languages. There's a guy, a Canadian, named Powell Janulis, or Powell mm -hmm. Janulis. He's uh, credited with knowing 42 different languages. What? Another guy named Ziad Faza. Um, uh -huh. He, uh, I think, is the current record holder at 59. Wow. These are kids or just people? People. Okay. And then back in the 1850s, the governor of Hong Kong, Sir John Browning, mm -hmm. was reputed to know 200 languages and speak 100 of them. What? That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, that's what everybody said when they, they met him. Yeah. And he said, would you like to hear that in 100, 100 different ways? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, before we break real quick, I did want to mention, because one of the things I, when I was sort of assigning this article out was like, is there, you know, is there any like research on why Americans tend to be less multilingual. Mm -hmm. And there's really not research that I've seen, but it seems to be that there's just like, you don't think of it when you live in a big city and you're, you're, you have people that speak all kinds of languages in big cities, but lots and lots of America uh, d doesn't do that. <laughs> well, they're not exposed to it as much. Just by That's what I mean. Naturally. It's like lo lots of towns and lots of, of cities in America you don't get a lot of foreign languages. So if you don't have that exposure, then you're you're probably not going to be as interested. Mm -hmm. And then there are also, and I'm not going like to call anyone out, but like there are also a lot of people that still think like, well, no, gosh darn it. Like this is what you speak here and this is what you're going to learn here. Yeah. And I don't want you learning any Spanish or anything like that. People used to say that publicly. Yeah. Um, I'll bet, though, it'd be easy to study if you, you know, went along the border with Mexico. You'd probably find way sure. more bilingual people than, say, in Atlanta. Right. Um, or the border of Canada. You find more people who spoke Canadian and English. Um, <laughs> it'd be easy to study is what I'm trying to say. I don't know why anyone I has think you're it. Right. Uh, should we take a break? Sure. All right. Let's break and we'll go learn a language and we'll be right back. So, Chuck, I got fascinated with this critical period stuff that we kind mm -hmm. of went over the, the critical period hypothesis. It makes a lot of sense to me. And there's, it's backed up by some research. Apparently, what the, the problem with the Seely Dan guys' um, hypothesis was that they went mm -hmm. too far. They, they yeah. made it too absolute. And it's just not the case that people can't learn things as adults. I mean, they should have probably figured that out from the outset. Um, but it is much harder to learn a language as an adult than it is to learn an L1 language as a kid or even L2 language as a kid. Yeah, and I used to hear when I was younger, because fluency is a is a funky word that I, I don't even know like everyone agrees on what that means. Mm -hmm. Because when I was younger, I used to hear, you know, and this is just that probably playground stuff, you know, when you're just talking linguistics right. on the playground sure. by the jungle gym. Like uh, I used to hear two things. One is you can never be fluent in another language because you're always translating it in your mind. Mm. And to be truly fluent means that you are thinking in that language. Uh, not true. You can... You, thinking in another language is a learned skill, as it turns out. Okay. You can teach yourself to do that. Uh, and then the other thing I heard was you can never be fluent or maybe a sign of fluency is, is your, if you dream in a different language. And that isn't true either because I looked that up today and apparently even like basic knowledge of another language, you can dream in that language. I think if, you know, how dreams go, if you're like thinking about that before you fall asleep, you might dream in a language. Hmm, that's interesting. And, and it apparently has nothing to do with fluency. God, is there anything that you heard on the playground that you could trust? Uh, yes, is that your father could be sued for all the money that he's got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very easily by a child, apparently. Sure. 
Oh, no, I think the kid's parent would usually sue. My dad's going to sue your dad. That's how it worked. Yeah, typically. I mm-hmm. mean, even as a kid, you knew that you had very little standing in the court of law. That'd be a funny sketch for a sketch show, like a, like a juvenile court. If there My were... dad's going to sue your dad, and then they actually take it, and adults try the case. <laughs> if there were funny sketch shows on TV anymore, that would be great. Oh, but there are. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I think you should leave with Tim Robinson. Oh, is... that's true. Very funny. With uh, Party Hardison, too. Right. Have you seen her Instagram stuff? Uh, no. Is that an account I should follow? She, yes, for sure. Um, I don't know if that's, I think that is her handle on Instagram. But she's a writer. She's also on um, uh, his his show, like, as a character here or there, and she's hilarious. Um, but yeah, she's great, too. I think I might know who you're talking about. Do you remember, I I think in the first episode of the first season, they're doing kind of like a shark tank thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the sharks is like, I'm rich because I won the lottery. Now I drink wine all day long. I can't get enough wine. Do you remember that, that woman? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's them. And I can't remember their real name. Party Hardison is just their handle, but I think it's like Patty Harrison or something. It is. It's Patty Harrison. And I knew her from A.D. Bryant's show, Shrill, that was so great. Oh, I never saw that one. I I need to follow. uh, It was good. I need to follow um, Harrison's account, though, because she, like, every time I see her on TV, I'm like, she is one of the weirdest comedians. Yeah. Oh, you should see her. And in, like, all the best ways. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) But, yeah, I think you should leave is amazing. So where were we? Uh, 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 you were talking about a uh, critical period. Yeah, that's right. So um, the the whole idea of why it's harder for a kid or for an adult to learn um, a, a language, a new language, than it is a kid mm-hmm. is because supposedly there is this critical period. There's a, a window of time. Mm-hmm. It's estimated to end anywhere from five to your mid-teens uh, where your brain is like, I'm down for whatever. Teach me whatever you want. I'm going yeah. to. I'm going to learn it. It's you. You just have a um, higher degree of neuroplasticity, right? You can form and adjust new neural connections, which is the basis of learning and in, in, in um, like memorizing and retaining new things. Yeah, and we you know talked about the fact that now we know that we can regenerate new neurons, make new neural connections. Mm-hmm. All the good things that you can do as a child in that critical period, you can still do as an adult. Um, Should we talk about inhibitory neurons? I want to do at least a short stuff on them, if not a whole episode. They are fascinating. Yeah, I feel like we've talked about them before, for sure. Uh, These are neurons that basically say, you know, is this new input that I'm getting worth making a neural connection for? Or am I just watching another dumb sketch show? (laughs) And um, they give weight to, like, n- new things and novel experiences. So I would think that those inhibitory neurons are, uh, if they're still around when you're an adult, then learning a new language is new and novel, so they would fire up, right? You would think so. But apparently they have kind of set your language in, in, in stone, and the only explanation, because I had the same question as you, it's like, that's novel, that's new. Those are new combinations yeah. of sounds. Why wouldn't it activate your inhibitory neurons to just stand down, right? And the best I could come up with, this is just me editorializing, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. Okay. Is that those new novel sounds are still following the same neural pathways that, say, English does. It's like mm-hmm. the, the neural pathways you're, you established for language, Right. Mm-hmm. And that it's not distinguishing a, a signal, a different signal coming from um, that same neural pathway, mm. uh, whether it's in Spanish or in English, it's still traveling that same neural pathway. And the thing is so well worn that the inhibitory neurons like it's going to take a lot for me to let you fire anymore because you know this stuff. That kind of makes sense because I was reading that L2 acquisition as an adult um it kind of giveth and receiveth the mm-hmm. fact that you already know a language because um, there's one school of thought that's like, well, since you've done it before and you know what language is and what grammar sort of is in, let's say, English, that it might be easier to pick up as a concept because you already know that stuff. And then I've also read other schools of thought that says, well, no, it's just more difficult because you've ingrained those things. Right. 
But the thing is, is you can overcome that. You can be like, no, no, brain, I need you to pay a little more attention. This is novel stuff we're trying to do. And apparently as an adult, if you put adults and kids head to head mm-hmm. in a test, which is hilarious. Um, Pizza strength. Yeah. Uh, it always reminds me of um, Billy Madison, like smacking that, blocking that shot from that little kid on the playground. Yeah. Um, if, if you put adults and children head to head in language acquisition, um, adults just dust kids in almost every category. The difference is kids develop a richer understanding or acquisition of language. Adults as a second language are acquiring something more intellectually than, than you know, more fundamentally. That's interesting. By the way, I've never seen Billy Madison. Oh, Chalk. Does he block a shot on the playground of a kid? Yeah, with um to to uh, the Ramones beat on the brat, it's perfect. Because Bill Murray does that in Rushmore. Did he copy that? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure Billy Madison was out. Yeah, long before Rushmore for sure. Although I just saw Asteroid City, and I was just reading up on that and other Wes Anderson stuff. Rushmore came out 25 years ago, dude. Oh no, my god! Please stop. Isn't that stop crazy? Saying things like that. I know. My God. So we should probably go over, though, like, uh, and I know we talked about this a little bit, so we can kind of speed through it, but the language learning parts of the brain. Oh, wait, I had one more thing on inhibitory neurons. Oh, let's hear it. So there's a, um, a key trait in Alzheimer's disease, which is your hippocampus or hypothalamus, one of the big H regions, starts going like in overdrive, like really becomes super active. And mm-hmm. they long thought that it was basically your brain trying to compensate for just the degradation of its of its functions. It's really trying to do whatever it can, and it does that as the hypothalamus or hippocampus. They think now that what's happened is your inhibitory neurons in your hippocampus or hypothalamus have worn away. And oh. that's what your brain would be doing if it weren't for inhibitory neurons. They're the ones that set the pace and the rhythm for your brain waves from nanosecond to nanosecond. And somehow they're all coordinated with one another to give you your experience of consciousness because you have tons of data coming at you all the time. They're the ones that decide what makes it into your conscious awareness and what doesn't. How? How do they do that? They're neurons. (laughs) There's one called a basket neuron that wraps itself around other neurons so it can control it more directly. And it looks like a basket just wrapped around a neural cell. It's amazing stuff. Is that a comforting thing or is it scary? That there's you inhibitory can be enveloped. neurons? No, that you, you can be enveloped in two ways, you know. Oh, no, that's scary for sure. Okay. I don't like anything enveloping anything else. It's just <laughs> creepy. Even a, a hug from your from your most beloved? Creepy. Okay. Everybody knows being touched is creepy. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, like I said, we're going to go over sort of the parts of the brain that, uh, that are have to do with language acquisition that we've talked about before, but they are three areas, uh, Broca's area, uh, Wernicke's area, and the angular gyrus. Yeah. Um, Two out of the three, uh, Broca's area handles the creation of language. That's the stuff that is really active, you know, when you're just a BB. Uh, Wernicke's handles comprehension. And then the angular gyrus is a bit of a hub that connects things together. Yeah, and we know that there's these distinct regions that do these distinct things because you can have damage to one region and the others yeah. will keep going. There's one called Wernicke's aphasia, which is where your 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 Broca's area is perfectly fine. You're able to say things, you're able to generate speech, you're able to talk, but the comprehension area is damaged, so you're not making any sense. And I think the yeah, it was the National Institutes of Health gave a um, an example of what a, sa- a, a sentence like that would sound like. Are you ready? Yeah, let's hear it. You know that Snoodle Pinkard, and that I want to get him round and take care of him like you want before. That, like that, you want before? That's what that's what like somebody would say if they have that type of aphasia, and you'd just be like, what? And they might not have any idea what they're trying to say either because right. their comprehension. Um, region is damaged both ways. So you you comprehend what you're saying. You also comprehend what other people are saying. And so in that sense, it's very disconnecting. Although Broca's area is disconnecting too, but apparently you can still get out enough 
like in a word or two that people generally know what you're saying with with where Nikki's aphasia, they can have no clue what you're saying at all. Yeah. And I think that was uh, what can happen when you have a stroke sometimes. Right. That's how it usually comes about. Yeah. that Because my granddad, when I was little, he had a stroke and he could understand what you were saying. And he would talk at you using, you know, walking, walking, see, rock and rocking, rocking. Mm-hmm. And they weren't even words. Mm-hmm. They were, it was just stuff like that. But and, they were uh, like enunciated and like, indiv- oh, yeah. like you could see that these are distinct things that he's saying. They're just nonsensical, uh-huh. right? Yeah, yeah. And it was very frustrating for him, which is, oh man, know, I'll I bet. Imagine. Especially if he knew what he was trying to say and people well, that's didn't the whole understand, deal. you know? Yeah, I think that's the, the thing. Um, it always reminds me of that that newscaster outside of the Emmys or the Oscars or whatever who yeah. had like – she said later it was a migraine, but she's like a very, uh, right. very heavy bear-tation. And yeah, I, bear-tation. I have no – I've never seen anybody say like this is what she was trying to say. I have no I, idea. Yeah, like a translation. Yeah. I know. And at the time, I remember people were like shaming people were like that she had a, a mini stroke mm-hmm. and like how dare you laugh. But it, that, I don't think that was the case, right? No. She had a migraine. A, Heavy, she had heavy bertation. A very, very heavy bertation. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to survive the final edit. I'm not sure. We'll see. I saw that video not like sometime within the past year again somehow. Yeah. It holds up. You know what else holds up is uh, Arthur the weatherman saying pretty much everywhere it's going to be hot. And then the, the, I don't know if I know that one. Oh, you do too. We talked about Arthur the Weatherman, Did we? and then the the news anchor goes, "Then I don't need a jacket." And then he just starts laughing like maniacally. He's the, the he's a um, I guess the the uh, the one of the weather people in Haiti. And that was his forecast. Pretty much everywhere, it's going to be hot. I, okay, maybe I have seen that. You then. have. Now that that yeah. was like 2007 or something. Uh, yeah, I think uh, when you said Haiti, I kind of zeroed in on it. I, I, I pulled it up from my Haitian file. <laughs> so as far as those, lang- those language areas of the brain, though, one thing that's sort of interesting is two out of the three of those are on the left side of the brain, on the, um, on, yeah, the left hemisphere. And so for like an adult human, language generally is on the left. But when you're a kid... Your brain is uh, it's firing all over. So they've done fMRI scans that shows that both hemispheres are, are going wild when kids are learning right. their language, which is interesting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. What also um, strikes me as interesting is that kids learn in a general pattern um, that you can predict. Uh, people like basically make charts. Like I was saying, like is it mm-hmm. is it is reading in first grade? You know, okay, oh, right. Like these these milestone charts. The idea that you can be like, oh, your kid's going to be saying this at age, mm-hmm. you know, eighteen months, or yeah. you know, by twenty four months they'll be putting two words together to make a sentence or something. Like I just think that's really neat, and I think it kind of underscores the idea that there is some sort of innate ability. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, desire to learn languages. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like it's uh, it, it's got to be evolutionary because it's a survival thing. Like you have to learn that language right. to know how to how to survive the world that you're born into. But then that supports behaviorism. You can be like, this is so important that you're born with a blank slate, no language acquisition skills or anything. But it's so important that you learn it just by observing and everything because you know that this is how you're going to survive. Or that it is innate and that you are born with a ability because it's, you know, passed down to you uh, through natural selection. Yeah? Or am I thinking of it wrong? I think the only way to settle this is for us to get in a Skinner box and debate okay. <laughs> between electric jolts. That sounds good. Uh, we'll take a break in a sec. But before we do, um, like you were talking about, that sort of process for kids, mm-hmm. um, their vocabulary grows Um, you know, very quickly from the time they start learning up until about the age of eight. And their vocabulary still grows for sure. Like, it never stops. I still learn new words all the time. But by the age of eight, supposedly by that time, if everything is on track, then a kid has has basically mastered how to speak at least and understands basic grammar Mm -hmm. and basic concepts, uh, sometimes even complex uh, concepts. But I think the vocabulary is the outlier where, like, you will always be learning words. Yeah. 
I mean, you're just not exposed to as many. I think there's like 300 main words used in English more than, you know, for like the vast majority of English is just a few hundred words, a couple hundred words. Yeah, I tell you, the the true sort of um, check yourself moment as a parent is when your kid is constantly asking what a word means when they're like Ruby's age. She's about to turn eight. Mm -hmm. um, What's the definition like, of is? Well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it really, cause it's hard to define a lot of words. So as you know, you're like, you'll, you know, what does this mean? I'll be like, oh, well, it means, well, I don't know what it means. Like how to define it. So I'll either look it up or I'll do my best and then look it up. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? What's your, what's your score? How often are you like, oh, I was right. <sighs> oh, I mean, I'm, <laughs> that, it's tough though. Cause some words are just hard to define right. in words. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I know what you're saying. I, I'm even having trouble putting this into <laughs> words. So let's take that break and uh, we'll be right back. By the way, I think the reason I was struggling was I was trying to think of an example recently mm -hmm. where she where she said, what does this mean? And I couldn't think of how to define it. Yeah, it was like you're it happens all the time, though. chewing gum and tap dancing at the same time. It's That's hard right. to do. You were talking while trying to recall some an incident at the same time. Yeah. Um, or it's just, you know, some words are just conceptually hard to really just sort of say in a few words that a kid would understand, you know. Sure. Like what? <laughs> Irony. <laughs> um, That's a great example. Here are some tips. Well, I guess we should talk a little bit about um, your expectation as an as, as an adult to learn L2. Uh, there was a paper in 2018 that basically said, you know, um, up to about 17 or 18, you're going to have a much easier time. Um, after that, it is, it is much more difficult to obtain what they call native-like fluency, uh, but like you, like we've been saying the whole time, it's not like it's impossible. It's just something that you're going to have to work at harder than when you would have when you were 16 or 17 or 10. Yeah, because you're overcoming those inhibitory neurons. And apparently yeah. the way you do that is by making a concerted intellectual effort to That's study right. and learn this language. Yeah, um, there are lot, lots of different ways. Uh, the immersion technique, uh, as Ed points out, there's there's nothing magic about it. Immersion just means you're just exposed more and more and you're repeating uh, a foreign language more and more and hearing a foreign language more and right, more. Right. So like we said earlier, watching that, that foreign language TV show, that can be a nice little training tool. Uh, but one thing Ed points out, which I never really thought about, is the second part, which is input and output. Like just watching that movie and saying like, oh, I'm understanding this, like that's great. But you got to be able to say it. You got to be able to write it. So maybe watch that movie and then like write a little summation of the movie in that language. Yeah, pretty neat. Um, you also need to know vocabulary. It's just, it's important. Uh, Got to do it. Yeah. I mean, if you if you can point to something, it's almost like having Broca's aphasia. You can mm -hmm. point to something and generally kind of say the word. People get what you mean. And you can build from that and learn grammatical rules over time. But the vocabulary is the basis of speech for sure. Yeah. You, you, there's no way around it. You are going to be looking and memorizing lists. But that's cool. I mean, the key here that I think people who teach languages have found in the last few decades, you do not do this in like any kind of marathon cramming way. You break it into manageable pieces, lessons mm -hmm. that are short enough to, and interesting enough to keep the person's attention who's, who's learning this extra language. Yeah. Uh, I saw another thing too, where it's easier. They found in studies, if they do it in a non-threatening environment, <laughs> <laughs> and that I knew you were going to laugh. It sounds funny because threatening means, you know, you get the idea of, you know, someone's like yelling at you to learn a language. Or like you're learning a language in like a dark alley. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what that really just means is like, like they did, did the study of Malaysian kids learning English and they found that they did better when it was done through like children's stories rather than like grammar lessons. I see. And like the grammar lessons would be like a threatening thing. And it's probably not a great use of the word. <laughs> But like threatening, meaning just sort of intimidating, I think maybe is the better word. No, for sure. But if you hadn't used that word, this would not be the classic episode that it is. That's right. 
uh, because I did see the goat to kind of tie in with that is um, native speakers, like when they are, come across someone who is maybe like in their country and someone is trying to speak their language a very in a rudimentary way, then you will often go into what's called like um, foreigner speak or teacher talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's akin to that baby talk where they will sort of sort of dumb down and slow down their speech a little bit. And what they're really doing is making a non-threatening environment. Oh, OK. That makes sense. Yeah. Another thing you want to do that I found very difficult is mimicking the sounds that you're hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, and apparently, even if you're not getting it quite right, you're still getting your mouth used to mm -hmm. saying, making the sounds, the phonemes of that language. Uh, and then you'll they'll just get better and better, at, or you'll get better and better at it over time with practice. But it's not something you just jump into necessarily. You can learn by imitating, like a kid. Is this uh, the same thing as like when my mom would speak a little like a British person when she would meet someone who was British? <laughs> oh, did she do that? Is she like Madonna? Yeah, she did that occasionally. Wow. Or, or a couple of times that I remember. We didn't know a lot of British people growing up, but I remember on vacation a couple of times. <laughs> meeting people, and my mom was, like, all of a sudden saying words that they were saying that she's never said before, and I was like, what's going on? <laughs> she's like, fresh in your drink, Kafner. Yeah, sort of. It's trying to trying to fit in. <laughs> um, but with the imitation, and I'm not, trust me, my, my impressions are not great, but I, I've always been able to, like, mimic a sound pretty well since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And so when I was taking German, I always got complimented on my, my pronunciation and my diction because I could just roll the R and I could make it, I could make it sound like my teachers are always like, Hey, listen, you're not the best German speaker, but you sound fairly German when you're speaking it. And other kids in there, I remember, especially in the South, you would get these people speaking <laughs> yes. German with like a Southern accent. I remember that too in French class. And yeah, and just couldn't make that separation. And I think I always had a little bit of a leg up because I was always trying to mimic or impersonate or do impressions and stuff like that since I was a kid. Did you end up wearing one of those kind of alpine caps with the feather in it no. in high school? Did you take it no, to that no, extreme? No. I was not the St. Pauli girl or boy. I didn't have lederhosen, uh, but uh, had pretty good pronunciation. That's impressive. Nice, nice work, Chuck. But that kind of goes to what you're saying is just like practice the sounds of that language because the sounds of the of German are, can be very different than English. Exactly. Um and then there's there's so there's so many apps out there. It's crazy to, yeah. to just learn that have figured out how to break these down into like digestible sections. And if you want to learn a language as an adult, there's never been a better time to do it mm -hmm. um, or an easier time even, I would say. Um, but there are some reasons you might want to learn a language as an adult. If you're not traveling, if you don't have a significant other who speaks another language, um, mm -hmm. There's, if you stop and think about it, there's not that many reasons you would think of to learn another language other than to show off. Mm -hmm. But in showing off, I'm sure, is, is one reason some people learn languages. But there's other things that studies have shown people who learn additional languages exhibit more than others who, who are um, monolingual. Um, and one of them is empathy, apparently. Yeah, that makes sense. They've done studies, and it's proven. If you're bilingual, you are more empathetic uh, than if you than if you speak one language. Yeah, try to dispute that. You can't do it. Yeah, try it in two languages. That sounds to me just, it just smells like one of those social psychology studies. For sure. But I like to think that it's true. It makes sense. Uh, it also said supposedly that if you're bilingual, you're better at conflict management. Mm -hmm. um, I said before, uh, problem solving, uh, and that kind of ties in with the next, uh, on the list here, cognitive abilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a variety of things cognitively that um, you supposedly perform better on if you're bilingual. Yeah, like semantic conflict tests where they mm -hmm. show you the word red, but the, it's colored in blue and they ask you what color it is and your brain's like, does not compute. If yeah. you're bilingual or multilingual, apparently you score better on tests like that. Um, it's not entirely clear why. But that kind of goes to show that it supports that showing off idea. People just inherently know that you're smarter and superior mm -hmm. to them if you know more languages than they do. Yeah. And uh, like you were talking about earlier with Alzheimer's, if you it, it's a workout for your brain. So any any time you're doing something so sort of um, uh, intimidating and drastic as learning a, a completely new language mm -hmm. a little later in life, mm -hmm. you are giving your brain a real 
really solid workout. Yeah. Supposedly, uh, all bilingual Alzheimer's patients had onset five years later on average than monolingual Alzheimer's patients. Man, that's that's, that's a enough. lot of years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you got anything else about learning a language, Chuck? Uh, nine. <laughs> Good pick, by the way. Nice work. Uh, Thanks. If you want to learn more about learning a language, go learn another language, and you can figure it out firsthand. And since I said that, of course, it's time for listener mail. I'm going to call this um, Josh owes Chuck an apology. Is that what that said? Oh, boy, this sounds familiar. Yeah. Again? Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey guys, this is from a trucker. We got we heard from a lot of truckers, which I knew we would, yeah, which is great. Sure. Hey guys, really enjoyed the the trucker uh, episode. Um, I thought it was funny and ironic when you two had a disagreement of the pronunciation of Stevedore <laughs> during listener mail. Uh, Chuck confessed to not questioning Josh when he used it earlier in the show, mm-hmm. thinking it was better to not appear ignorant. Mm-hmm. Uh, then Josh pontificated about how it's pronounced exactly like it's spelled, Steve Dore. But I got news for you guys. It's most assuredly Steve Adore. Uh, so, Josh, please apologize to Chuck. Sorry, Chuck. No problem. <laughs> Thanks for the fun, guys. Yours knowingly. That's a great sign off. Steve Dore. <laughs> oh, man. I wish. Uh, Tom Hubert in Seattle, Washington. Tom Hubert's another name for a longshoreman. No, is it? Uh, Tom Hubert. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's Tomei Hubert. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Tom. We appreciate you big time. And uh, keep on trucking. Tom was a trucker, right? I don't know. I think is in the industry somehow. Okay. Uh, well, if you want to be like Tom and you're in some sort of industry that we've touched upon, you want to correct us, that's cool. We're always open to that. You can be like Tom and be very nice about it. We appreciate those the most. But either way, you can send us an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 